Hello there. Good day. <laughs> I can see you. I think I can even hear you. Yeah, I hear clicking. That's not my clicking. No, that was mine. I had to swap the headphones back and forth. Uh, I try to tune out over the weekend as much as I can, but I did see you posted something on the weekend that I'll go back and look at. I lose track of all the stuff I <laughs> post sometimes. There is a lot. Uh... Good morning. Good morning, Jose. Wait, what? how do I pronounce your name, actually? Joao. Joao, OK. Good morning. Or good day, Joao, because I have no idea what time zone you're in. I won't make any assumptions on the pronunciation of your name of where you live, so. We'll give another minute or two. Nias is first up, but we'll wait a moment. If folks could sign in, that would be great. I'll paste the message here. Yes, you'll be up to go through your uh, PR. So whenever you're ready, we'll just start there. Uh, just setting my windows. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so this one is uh, revisiting uh, some of the key management scenarios that we had discussed earlier. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, new uh, folks that have joined the conversation since we last had this chat. Um, so I think it's uh, it's worth uh, reviewing some of the overview and definitions and personas that we had here. 
the link is uh, is in the meeting note, um, and um, I think we can take like ten minutes to read through. Uh, we should stop reading um, at this point, which is right after requirements for a discussion. Um, most of the requirements that are listed here um, in previous discussions, um, we were all aligned on. Um, the one place that we didn't have alignment on a requirement was a uh, having a mechanism for rotating a root key. Uh, there's both pros and cons here, um, and we've kept I've captured some of those in the document here. Um, we I'd like to kind of at least uh, in the 20 minute conversation figure out um, are there any additional considerations we need to take into place and uh, if any what other data do we need to kind of make a uh, decision here and move on. So um, I'll give folks 10 minutes to read through uh, the link and then we can start discussions.
I uh, wanted to do a quick time check. Uh, do we need a few more minutes or is everyone done reading? Maybe a thumbs up for people when they're, yeah. I'm done anyway. Okay. Um, does anyone need more any more time? Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen again for the comments. All right, I see. Uh, let me refresh. Let's see. Okay, I see a few comments from Steve. Uh, should not to become must not. Uh, see the same comment throughout. Um, thank both of. What's the difference there, Steve? I uh, just there was two of them. I think it was two of them. Um, this one was. Uh, Let's see, signing an artifact should require the person to perform additional actions. Yeah, must not. So basically, we want to be able to support offline signing. And it's, if we say should, I'm worried that somebody would build a CLI that somehow enforces uh, communication with the registry and kind of breaks that flow. So it's more a matter okay. of to, to support offline signing, um, we need to be able to, to do it all locally. There was an interesting conversation in the distribution working group related to that. Um, and then the same thing for multiple signatures. Um, I think that was that was the other one. Okay. Uh, so this next. doesn't seem to address the question of um, some. You know, if you do it offline, of course, they could be revoked in the meantime. Is there some time frame? Like you should you have you need to be online every so often. Or is that just ignored or? Oh, sorry, the offline is, sorry, you're, you're, you're bringing the air gap environment. So that's a good conversation too. This is more of, I'm in an ephemeral build client and we've been talking about the consumption of ephemeral clients. And recently we've, Brandon's brought up some good conversations around in the build environment. We need to be able to do build in an ephemeral isolated environment. That's kind of like the, one of the twists on the protecting from the solar winds kind of scenario. Um, so it's, it's, signed, it's built and signed. And then, but it's not sitting there for weeks or months. It's built and signed and then pushed through a registry in a secure uh, channel. That there's no real time note. And to your point, sure, I could be okay. signing. That, make, that makes sense. Um, I'm just wondering, does that need to be spelled out here? Or is it, would it be clear to everyone in that case? It probably could on. be read it and reword it in such a way that's basically saying the offline, I'll have to go back and reread it. And, and it's, a, it's a great point. I think we should track that as a scenario. Um, we do have a list of detailed scenarios that covered some of those use cases. Um, I wanted to go back and visit requirements first before we do that, but uh, I think that's uh, the, the use cases so far have really looked more at um, deploying in the air-gapped environment, not necessarily building in an air-gapped environment. So those are some additional use cases I think that can be added in. I think 
one of the concern I have, which I think I've brought up before, is just the um, the phrasing that the val the validation shouldn't be perform any additional actions with the registry, because obviously at the very least you can have to pull the signature or the the file that that has that information, as well as any key, any information about how you get that key and other things. I just think it's a little unclear exactly what that means. Yeah, there, I, I it sounds like maybe the term you know, it sounds like maybe the term validating should be clarified by breaking it into more than one part. Because I think you're talking about validating as in, OK, we have we, we've, we've got the keys, we're comfortable with, with that they're up to date and then we want to validate. Versus I've got this new image and I want to validate it. I have to, of course, start by getting the keys, so. Yeah, exactly. I think I understand what you mean, but I feel like it could be very easily misunderstood there. Right. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair point. Do you mind uh, putting in a comment so we can track that? Yeah, sure. I, I think to catch like we want to be able to say, I'm trying to deploy this thing. Can I get the signature before I even get like, you don't want to pull the, in a container image scenario, you don't want to pull the image and bring the Trojan horse into the environment just to find out whether it should be there, right? The, the idea is let me figure out, find the signature, get the keys, maybe discover from the registry where to get the keys from. That's something we haven't actually resolved yet. Um, I think the pull, well, sorry, let me finish the thought. So you'd be able to get the signature, get the keys somehow, discover the keys somehow and get the keys somewhere, and then be able to validate locally. Um, probably there's something in there about, I shouldn't have to pull the artifact itself to validate it um, to move forward. The, the, the concern that I was trying to raise is probably more on the push side because there was this conversation that today, the way the container clients work is the digest isn't actually computed in typical workflows until it's pushed to the registry. And that kind of breaks the workflow that we're trying to articulate. So I think the build, the pull, and the air gaps got commingled in here in a way that we should try um, to do in, a uh, do in a clean way. So Steve, for your next comment, uh, the additional signatures, I hadn't tracked this as a key management scenario requirement. Um, I think this fits more into the signature format itself. Uh, do we have a separate doc that's tracking that? Can you help me with what the difference is? Because I don't know how many signatures a publisher would put on the same artifact versus multiple entities would put additional signatures on a single artifact. So being able to add in additional signatures, that's really dependent more on how you are uh, formatting and storing the signature, right? Um, and, and I think that's, that's something that we want to capture in a requirements that says, um, what are the requirements for the signature format itself? I think we have some requirements there in terms of where a signature is stored, how a signature is retrieved um, that don't necessarily tie in with the uh, uh, key management uh, scenario. So um, we can create a separate uh, signature uh, format doc. And I think that addresses some questions uh, around what exactly are we signing in terms of what bits and what does that mean in terms of like how containers get packaged. So I think that is an area we need to dive into, um, but I think that's probably a better place to capture this this requirement than in the key management scenario. Fair enough, that's fair. Which begs the question, do we have a signature requirements doc? We don't have a signatures requirements doc as we have the, the requirements for the notary and then workflows, which that is captured in it. But the signature is there to support the requirements. So we didn't really make a requirements, a signature requirements. Okay. 
Um, can we track this in the overall doc then for now? Okay. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll pull this out. I'll, I'll reject this one. I, I am curious. Why do we need multiple signatures, though, from a, uh, a publisher? Like, is the is the requirement there that in the same signature file I'd have multiple signatures, or can an, an author like what? I'm still little. I can throw an example. Thing. Yeah, I can throw an example. I can think of some client environments that might use signing as kind of an auditing method to say this this artifact that they've signed has gone through the CI build. Okay, now it went to the next step of it, went through a security team that went through a security scanner on that and it passed the security scanner that might have its own signing on it. So I could see something like that within a single entity where they use signing for that. Okay, so that's more of just a multiple signatures as opposed to it's specifically multiple signatures from the publisher. It'd be a single publisher, but multiple signatures there, different Is roles within the publisher. What I'm trying to figure out is there's something unique that it's the publisher that's signing multiples. Can we also be if looking at signing multiple tags? Multiple, I'm sorry, Brenda, go ahead. Can we also be looking at one publisher signing different tag names for the same artifact? Uh... All right. What I what I think I'm hearing, just for the sake of moving forward, is I'm thinking I'm hearing things more around multiple signature scenarios as opposed to something to do with the key. So, I guess I'm. We can move on. I, I just I, I'm a little confused by this one. Like, is there something specific around the publisher versus everything that Brandon's talking about is completely valid, but I don't get it that it's tied to the publisher. So it, it, I don't think there's a difference. I'm so curious who's seeing CF distribution because I thought I was. I'm curious who else is logged in. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the, uh, what this uh, comment is about the ephemeral bill client? Want me to chime in on that one, Steve? Yeah, please. Yeah, so in another one of the discussions, I forget where we were talking about supporting ephemeral environments and, and being able to inject the keys into that ephemeral environment. And this is kind of hitting on the point that I put back to Steve over the weekend, which was that you not only have ephemeral environments verifying signatures, but you may also have ephemeral build environments that are creating signatures. And so we probably want to support both of those scenarios. Is there anything that needs to get added to this requirement to make that clear? Um, because the way I was reading it, I thought it would cover that. I think it's covered, um, Steve. Yeah, I think we might just want to tie it back with those words. Okay. Just create the loop. I think uh, maybe this is something we need to add to scenarios to kind of go into more detail. Okay. Uh, and then Marina on your comments, um, I think the, the clarification here is once you pull a signature and once you pull the artifact, um, those two should have, uh, you shouldn't You shouldn't need to pull anything else from the registry um, is what this was getting at uh, beyond just sort of like being able to uh, pull artifacts from the registry itself. Okay, I mean, I don't uh, I'll make really this... understand this requirement. Like, is there any technical reason why that would be a problem to pull additional things from the registry? So we don't want registries to be a dependency for validating a signature. Um, uh, registries can serve the signature, but they should not be in the validation path. Okay, but so, they, 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 so there'd be additional, so you'd have to have an additional dependency outside of the registry to then pull that information? Potentially, yes. Okay, but, there's, but is there any reason like there couldn't be the option to have that also on the registry? Um, just to centralize things and make it easier? So 
I think this this is this is one we've had uh, previous discussions on. Registry operators can act in multiple roles um, in the sense that they could, uh, depending on how we align on the key management uh, designs, there may be roles that they take on as part of it, but these should not be part of like what a core registry needs to provide. Um, the goal here really is to make sure that you can move artifacts from one registry to another uh, and have the signature still be intact. Um, and having a registry dependent uh, workflow there means that you'd also need to replicate additional uh, things beyond just the signature and the artifact. So this is really um, standing a requirement to make sure that step is not needed. Yeah, but I think that the requirement there is that um, images are able to move and that um, registries don't have to do any additional work. I don't know if the requirement is that you can't use a registry to do anything else. Um, if you're using the registry to do something else, wouldn't that imply that there's additional steps the registry needs to perform to validate a signature? Well, it, the registry could be one option for additional steps. Like, you know, because if, if cause I think I could see some situations in which, um, in which, you know, you wouldn't want to interact with the registry and you want to do a third party service. But I could also see situations in which you wouldn't want to set up all these dependencies on third party services. And it'd be easier to just have that all in one place. I just feel like forbidding it um, doesn't make as much sense to me, even if it's not like the go-to solution. Yes, what was what was it we were trying to protect with here, with this sentence? Like I, so I, if I, if you have, let's say, an additional API or additional information that you need to go to a registry for, um, then when you move one artifact from one registry to another, you need the second registry to support similar functionality, right? And so this is essentially where we're building in um, additional workflows for signature validation. Um, I think the probably one way to address this is calling this out as optional, um, in which case we can say that some registry operators may decide to kind of provide this additional functionality, uh, but that would sit outside of like, you know, what a registry operator is required to provide. So a registry operator, there's nothing preventing them from potentially operating as a CA if that's the right, like, you know, design forward. Um, but that doesn't mean every registry would need to be a CA at that point, right? And we need to kind of make sure you're going back to the original CA that issued the search to validate them. Yeah, exactly. I think that that makes sense. Basically, it's not um, okay. whether they can't do it, but that they shouldn't have to do it. I feel like that's the, the distinction. Okay, so I'll clarify the language to make sure this is optional. Isn't the should not already a sign that this is optional? If we convert this to a must not no, then, then is a problem but if if we if we keep the should not it shouldn't it can it's up to the implementation right but if you want to be more specific we can have an optional one in front of it so basically we'll just try not to have that very coupled thing we did with notary one is that the the goal here yeah, essentially, you, you wouldn't want uh, every registry to have to set up a, a notary implementation and then plug um, signature data from one artifact from one registry to another for that. Um, I'll explore making this uh, clarifying this language a little bit more optional. I think we're aligned on what this requirement needs to say. So I'll track this in the comment and I think we can move on. Okay, um, were there any other comments on the uh, requirements? I don't see uh, any other in, posted in the pull request. Some in there, but that might have shown up in a different place because I think I probably clicked review instead of comment. Let's see. Um, I don't see any more. Um, could you maybe go through them and I can. Yeah, they're over in the requirements file itself, but it's just not showing up in the comments. So I don't know if I just clicked the wrong button.
Yeah, I see a bunch of comments from Marco, Trisha. Um, and Brandon. Uh, can you send me the link to view comments? Uh, I see comments from the previous iteration. Uh, let me pull what Brandon put in. I've got a, yeah, I've got a different one in there where I was putting the comments directly in the scenarios file. I'm sure I just clicked the wrong button. GitHub does that to me now and then. So on 28, the only comment I had there, line 28, um, just at the push is going to limit the number of APIs we can call. And I know we have APIs for things like querying and other things like that, that we might want to be able to run for some of these things. So just want to capture that little piece in there instead of saying just to push an unsigned artifact, but there might be other things to query or pull or fetch an unsigned artifact too. Okay. To you elaborate, like uh, pulling or pushing, and like, we definitely want to solve the problem with node review one where if you, if you were turned on signing or not, you shouldn't get different content. Like the digest Correct. content should always be the same content regardless whether it is. Yeah, the, the actual manifest you pull back will be the same, but the scenario I'm thinking of here is that signing an artifact may require that we query the registry to say, show me all of the tough um, targets metadata for this thing. And so you have to run a query against it to pull that back so that you can send an update for the newest tough art, you know, metadata. I would worry about that when we do the implementation if we did it that way, but I'm not, that's what yeah. I'm trying to figure out. Like if we were to do anything with time stepping and other things, I, I assume it's the registry that have to maintain it. Yep. Yeah, I think maybe that's also something to cover in the uh, signature specifications in terms of what do we actually end up signing. Um, an ideal situation is where you're able to sign the bits before they've even gone to the registry, right? So having to query registry for data before you sign it um, might break, uh, might reduce some of the things we want to cover there. So I think that's uh, uh, that's definitely something we want to uh, push up in the signature formats discussion. And this, that that's a good point where we might be separating the pushing of the signature from the doing the signing itself. And so you can sign it locally, do all that. And when you push the signature, that might involve a couple back and forth of saying, okay, not only do I want to push the signature, but I also want to push an update to the target's metadata on all the signatures up there. Right. Other than that, I would say it's an implementation detail. I, I, I still think that would be a, there shouldn't be any client interaction to do that. And I'm not, like, what do we want to capture from requirements? Again, we are trying to spec an implementation, we're trying to make sure the requirements are capturing the constraints we want to work within. And I think part of what Niaz was had written around the additional integrations with the registry, we're trying to protect from us building this. So, I, I don't know that I don't know how to describe the sidecar dual implementation thing. I think we just stick to the requirements. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, and I think I found the button that has missed, so my changes might show up now on my comments. Ah, yes, they show up now. Yeah. When you say start a review, suddenly there's, everything goes into a holding state. Um, another one of my comments, line 37, 
for signature validation must be enforceable in an air gap environment. Um, kind of goes back to another comment I had earlier of, does this handle checking for the key revocation? Yeah, it, it needs to. Um, the What we had done when we jumped into the scenarios in the previous iteration was call out what air-gapped environments would need to do additionally to enable that signature revocation, whether that was copying revocation data over uh, and a push versus pull model. I think there are design considerations there, but uh, the overall design needs to make sure that it can be enforceable. I think there's a trade-off decision here in terms of like, you know, how quickly we can refresh that data, but a mechanism to refresh that data needs to exist. Okay. So it's, it's not immediate as soon as you re revoke a key that it's immediately uh, discovered within the air gapped environment. You're saying there's going to be an extra process that could be done in that scenario to make it possible. Right. And then as we're moving between different repositories, make sure I'm on the same page you are. As we're moving artifacts around, the, the concern I have there is more when you're signing tags and it's, I think it's possible, it's just something that's on the client side. So I just wanna make sure that we have the same thought process that there'll probably be a client side process to handle verifying uh, tag signing. Just trying to do that on the server feels like it's almost impossible or in, in the API itself. Yeah, I think we, we had questions around tag verification before uh, around sort of like, you know, whether, what does that offer? Um, do we want to enforce digest verification only? Um, and that might be more a conversation to have um, in the um, in the overall requirements um, because that, that does, I think, lead to some challenges. Um, yeah, and we've got an issue for that one opened up already. So that's probably best handled in that issue. I just want to make sure that we saw that when we were looking at this one because it could have an impact for this. Okay. And then I'm getting into the root key rotation stuff. I will save this comment because I think that's going to be the larger conversation we want to yep. have. Yep. Okay. And then back to the push comment. We already, we already discussed that one. We've already discussed. Okay. Um, did anyone have any comments on the uh, up to sort of like the requirements here that we haven't addressed? It's before the requirements for discussion. Okay. Um, let's move to this this requirement then. Um, I think there's there's both sort of like pros and cons here. Um, so Brandon, since I you had a comment here. Um, do you want to elaborate on what your thought process here was? Yeah, the thought process that once you lose access on that root key, you're pretty much hosed in terms of security. Someone can make any number of delegated keys they want to do signing on. They can sign any artifacts they want to. And so your repo is pretty much done at that point. You're going to be forced into some kind of out of band update of the root key and getting that pushed out to all the clients and doing the revocation and everything else on that. So you've got that headache no matter what. And so I'm trying to understand the value add of not allowing an M-band rotation of a root key if the concern is someone could also potentially, hey, they can potentially use that hijacked root key to make new root key signatures. I, I think you're already in trouble at the point when your root key gets compromised. So I'm just looking for the value. Yeah, I think there's a that's a fair call out. The way um, we were thinking about this earlier is that your root also comes with certain information uh, associated with it, right? So um, if you think about uh, standard X509 roots, um, there's potentially a CRL there that you can go to and that CRL can give you an invalid response um, where you now know that the root has been compromised. So there's a mechanism that exists in tying a specific root as long as that root also has some kind of like a mechanism for sharing revocation data where you can notify everyone that's using uh, that root that, hey, something's broken, you need to go update this. Uh, the challenge with having um, a, an automated uh, update mechanism there is that now 
the attacker could potentially have a new root with the new CRL, which now they're vending, which means that the you lose that that capability of breaking um, your end users whenever you have that compromise. So that's the I think the trade off to kind of consider there um, is that um, do you would you from would you prefer to have that automated mechanism of letting your users know something is wrong and then have them decide what next steps they need to take versus you want to take that step on their behalf and then you know if something does go wrong you then have to kind of do a mass communication to kind of get that messaging out so that's really where that trade-off boils down to so would there be a way when you're thinking of doing these n-band rotations that you could say, hey, if this, if we revoked one root key, that that also revokes all the other ones that got pulled into an in-band rotation process? Um, I think we'd need to think through that because what you're, what you're essentially doing in that rotation is technically not a rotation as much as you're issuing an intermediate that's also acting as a root, right? Um, and so then, yes, you could, you could revoke the original root and that could potentially trickle down, but that rotation doesn't really do much in the sense that you still have to go back and check what the original root is signing off on, right? So what does that rotation really then give you? Well, I think it gives you that um, the, the implicit revocation of keys. So you can have your root key timeout eventually. And after that timeout, you can um, you know create a new root key seamlessly to users. Because you don't want keys that last forever because um, anything can be broken in forever. Right. And so I think like the way we've typically seen root rotations handled is you start using a new root before the current root expires, right? Uh, and you give enough time uh, where the two roots overlap uh, rather than signing the new root with the existing root. Um, authenticating the new root with the existing root means that you're saying that this route, you should trust this route because it was signed with the original route. But then to know if there's been any revocation or anything's happened, you actually need to go back and check, still go back and validate whether the original route was, was valid or not. So you're creating a chain there, and but deciding to stop partially up the chain in, in terms of validation, which didn't really make, uh, the, I don't think quite addresses the, 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 the thread vectors there. Well, the scenarios I'm thinking of are you have a user that went through the process to trust your original root key. And then you go through the process internally of saying either we need to update it because the old one's timing out or we need to sign it because we want a higher key length on our root key. You know, there are a long list of reasons you might want to rotate a root key. Right. And so for those clients that have the old root key that they are currently trusting, do you want to provide an automatic method for them to be updated? And so I'm thinking of all those ephemeral builders that might have a key injected in there. Should that automatically say, okay, I trusted the old root key, so therefore I should go ahead and trust the new root key as long as I verified that everything hadn't been revoked in the process there. Yeah, and I think that this doesn't like exclude the possibility of an out of band, out of band um, rotation if and when that's needed. Um, but I think in most cases, um, this question can be solved with an automatic rotation. And then only when you know things go truly, truly wrong do you have to bother with all this out of band communication. Um, but having support for this mechanism allows attackers to take advantage and set a new root information is, 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 is the trade off here, right? Um, and so if you have things like revocation information or other things built into the whatever the root key is signing off on, um, that is no longer verifiable and that no longer can be used in a mechanism to stop uh, to, to as, as a, as a uh, as a stop as a stopping function, right? I think that's the trade-off here that we need to address. Yeah, but if the clients, if the only reason the client trusts the new root key is because they're trusting the old root key and you revoke the old one, I feel like that could potentially propagate through as, as long as we design this right. And so the question then becomes, you know, what are you solving when you say, okay, the old root key got compromised and you know that's potentially exposing everything well until you send out that revocation out there and that gets approved, everything's vulnerable at that point. doesn't matter whether or not you sign a new root key or not with it, you're already vulnerable. Yeah, 
No, I, I agree. And I, and I would say like, what does issuing the new root achieve there, right? Because if you're going to still go back and have to chain back to the original yeah. root key, and, um, you have a technique. Yeah. Yeah. In that scenario, once you're compromised, I, I see you're going to have to go out of band. I don't think there is an in-band way to resolve that situation. You've been compromised at that point. You have to send a new key out, out of band process. But I'm looking for all the cases where you haven't been compromised and trying to make scenarios more useful for the users where they don't have to go through all this out of band process, just do regular maintenance on the stuff. There could also be a question here, I think that we may want to look at in terms of uh, who owns root keys and what do root keys signify, right? Like if you think about the traditional model of like CAs issuing certificates, like a CA essentially ends up holding a root, in which case individual developer search rotations, those things can happen more frequently, right? Um, I think that's probably a question that we haven't addressed here. Um, and I think there may be more of a threat model that we need to go into with those roles in place to kind of determine, you know, what is actually the right mechanism here. Is it a more secure update if you say, for example, like, you know, uh, a set of trusted routes within a Docker client that you could push out that has certain uh, trusted entities that may be a model that that's more uh, easier to update routes with. So I think the, there is uh, uh, there is something more to be had here. Um, do we do we want to take a, a, a pause in this and come back and have like a more detailed doc on this? I think there there are more things to consider here than what we've discussed. Let me throw one quick comment out, and then I would say. Yeah, if we want to go more detail to make sense. I'm just thinking from the scenario of just updating a Debian laptop here. I don't have to, when Debian says their old root key is coming close to expiration time and they send a new one out there, I as a user don't have to do anything. I just do my regular package updates and it pulls down the package that has the current root keys. And because I trusted the old key, that got pulled in and trusted and approved and signed and everything. And so it makes a much nicer user experience when I don't have to go through a whole lot of external out-of-band processes to get my clients to be able to work with the new environment when they already worked with the old environment. That's a great example of the key discovery and acquisition workflows. Like not only, we've, we've kind of, we haven't really answered it yet, but if, if we say we're not gonna worry about it for now, that's fine. I don't have to worry about how I get the Docker or, or the web and network signature for that matter. But what you're talking about there is is that problem as well. So to be able to, we don't want to do trust on first use, but I think once you have a key to be able to say, I can get updated versions of the key seems pretty important. Yeah, is it fair to say we need a mechanism for key distribution, right? Um, where we can get these updated keys that that's really the requirement to work backwards from? I think so. I think once you have it, to be able to maintain it is important. I don't know if like how do we how do we do the update scenario without getting into the tofu scenario? I think that's kind of the, the yeah way. we can we can look into that as we kind of start going through scenarios. But I'll update this to kind of capture uh, what the overarching requirement is without making any specific calls here. Sweet. So just to keep to our time frame, um, this is great. We've been trying to get to good key management conversation for a while. So this was really, really helpful to make all this great progress. Um, so we'll keep it going. Let's try to get figure out what we can do to get it merged. So the actual uh, document reflects our current state Then we don't have to read through all the notes. So I'll, I'll do my part to make sure that my comments are in a place that are obvious to be mergeable. And if we can do that in the others, that'd be great as well. Um, just on the point of order to get the status update out, was there any other feedback? I incorporated as much of the feedback as I could. Um, the, on the status report, it's in the HackMD doc. Let me just pull that up real quick. Copy link here to, and, um, so everything from the white backgrounds for the dark background effect to there was some good conversation around balancing uh, to the example commands provide too much detail that, you know, should I pull that out? But I thought actually there was a really good conversation that came out of it uh, as a result of the ordering of pushing digest before their tags 
so that we can get two independent entities pushed to the registry um, and then later do the tag update without trying to make some master transactional boundary. So to me, that kind of felt like a good balance. Um, but if there's some more in that way that we need to do, that'd be great. Uh, I think there's a, some of the other, there was two other pieces of feedback that was one, it looked complex and two, are we really making progress? Just putting a status report doesn't really show progress. So um, the complexity one's an interesting one. Um, that's the part where I can use more feedback. As far as making progress, that is another part that I wanted to talk about some timelines on things. But before I talk about the timelines going forward beyond what I put into the, the status doc, was there any other feedback we wanted to talk about before we merge and publish? Going once. Okay, I got a plus one for uh, merge. Okay, so on the timelines, let's transition to that um, because that is the piece that I think a lot of us are getting in a, in a difficult spot going, you know, for the ones that are working on it, we know we're making progress. We always want it to be faster. Outside of it, there's a lack of confidence because they're not really, it's not obvious. Um, and people are starting to spin up other efforts that it'd be great if the other efforts were actually as holistic, um, but they're much more sandboxed and don't really promise the cross registry solutions we've been working on. So um, after this doc, I, I have one thing related to teleport that I have to go finish up. But once this is my next thing after that, I want to be able to outline the three, I think it's three places that we need some investment that could use some help. One of which was the validation with open gatekeeper. We talked about doing that. Um, the teams in Azure that are happen to be part of Open Gatekeeper, they would like to, but they're not going to get to it right away because of other critical work they're on. So if there's other people that are at least close, if not in the Gatekeeper, Open Gatekeeper community, we'd love to prototype that. Uh, the reason I really wanted to be close to the Open Gatekeeper community is I want to avoid us, uh, this goes for all these things, building something that works around what exists today, as opposed to this is what we would like to see changed whether it be OPA, Gatekeeper, or Notary. So we really want people that are close enough to say, yes, I know enough around OPA and Gatekeeper to know that this would really work if we made this one change to OPA or Gatekeeper, um, as opposed to let me manipulate this thing to make it work only because I don't think I can change it. Like, these are all projects that are just code. We'd love to make changes to it. Um, so, oh well, yeah, I am referring to the open, open policy agent gatekeeper implementation. So basically the idea is we want to validate this with something very generic like Kubernetes because it's a very open framework and um, that we can actually validate the end-to-end -end review. And if we can validate the end-to-end -end with a, a true policy manager uh, like that, then we assume that we can do it with other projects, whether it be cloud specific projects or other things. That's the premise that we're doing there. So that's prototype, that's effort one is to get something going there with the validating the next end-to-end -end scenarios. Um, the other one was uh, the distri CNCF distribution changes. Uh, we'd like to see some changes, you know, there related to the artifacts um, manifest spec that we've been working on and a list API that we can get the link list for the signatures out of the registry. Uh, I'd been assuming that we were going to do that from our side because we were kind of already prototyping on that and we would make their next round of iterations. Um, it doesn't have to be us. And it, not, once we have the artifact spec, uh, artifact manifests more detailed, we, that should be easy for others to build in. And then of course is the updates to the MV2 client. So those are the three things. Um, there's something here for the person who won't identify themselves. So I'm quite challenging to even acknowledge them. Um, anyway. Uh, we're, we are at time, so we can talk more about it. Um, but I did get a, at least one plus one for the uh, just publish it and let's move on. Because um, I think a lot of people keep on asking. I have not been able to say, here's the written status of where we're at. So I'm hoping this captures it. Uh, with that, um, <laughs> <I don't, laughs> sorry, I'm looking at the comments. Uh, anyway, uh, with that, we'll post the recording. We'll keep going. And thanks for everybody's progress. Next week, folks.